Josh, if engineering were a useless kitchen gadget, you would be a bendy straw for drinking the contents of pureed steak. Drinkable steak. <laughs> yes. Welcome to Engineer vs. Designer. The podcast for designers. <laughs> Engineers. Non-vegetarians, makers, bakers, and people who spend a lifetime <laughs> studying failure. I'm Adam. Oh, and I'm Josh. This week, our very special guest is prolific author and design history expert, Henry Petrowski. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited about that. We'll start right. with a little background on Henry, courtesy of SolidsMac.com. And then we'll jump straight into that interview. Speaking of drinkable meat products, yes. Josh, expectorate the gristle of ignorance. <laughs> the meat straw of knowledge. What have you got for us this week? <laughs> this episode of Engineer vs. Designer is brought to you by CAD Junkie from mm -hmm. SolidWorks to Moto to Rhino. Learning CAD for industrial design just got a heck of a lot easier. So much easier. For a free membership, head over to CADJunkie.com. So, uh, we've done it before. We're doing it again. A mm -hmm. tweet for this episode has gone out. Yes, it has. Anyone who retweets that message will be entered into a drawing for a coveted Engineer vs. Designer t-shirt. Yet again. Now, last week's winner is... Kevin Quigley. Congratulations. <laughs> you, listener, could be next. Head over to twitter.com slash EVD1 and retweet away. As you know, we're talking with design expert Henry Petrosky today. Yes, Henry is well known for his many uh, books ranging from failure analysis to the history of the paperclip. Mm, starting in 1985 with the release of To Engineer is Human, the role of failure in successful design. Henry has written more than 17 books on engineering and design with the latest to forgive design understanding failure being released last year. So, and, and by the way, I'd like to throw a shout out to John, AKA engineer nerd on oh, Twitter, yeah. who actually requested that we talk to, uh, to Mr. Petrosky. This was uh, an idea that we did not come up with on our own. If you are uh, listening to this, keep that in mind. If you have somebody you'd like to hear from, let us know and uh, we'll try to get him on the show. So excited to meet this guy. Oh yeah. So, in an article for Slate, our guest, Henry Petrosky, wrote a great article, relatively recently, on the history of the automotive cup holder. Ooh. So, we're going to give you a little background on that, just to give you a little flavor of what this guy's up yeah. to. Yeah. Back in the day, bad roads and bad suspensions mean uh, that slurping your 32-ounce Slurpee mm -hmm. while driving was a very dangerous <laughs> endeavor indeed. So, most folks carried liquids to picnics in thermoses. Yeah, but when the drive-in restaurant and theater movement picked up, a few decades later, dining in a parked car went mainstream, which was originally accomplished with window-mounted trays. However, that only solved the problem for people in front seats, and only while sitting still. Mm. And that uh, made sense because people just didn't drink liquids on the go at that time, nope, so it was nope, fine. Nope. Fast forward to the introduction of the aluminum cans in the 1960s, and suddenly people wanted to carry their tasty beverages with them on the go. But as uh, every good Mario Kart player knows, it's a bit hard to shift gears and throw turtle <laughs> shells while holding a Jolt Cola. Thus, the first attachable cup holder was born. Ah. So, like most car interior innovations, the first cup holders weren't integrated into the car, Mm. but just attached to the doors in roughly the same place that those old drive-in trays had done before them. It just was a progression. But that makes slamming the car door pretty messy. <laughs> so the cup holders were moved yeah. to the center console, where you'll find them in most cars today. But, of course, while today's cup holders are more stable than uh, those in the past, they have mm. other problems, like obstructing all those controls and buttons you have on your fancy schmancy dashboard and uh, mm. making it hard to shift gears or being hard to reach without leaning over, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and finally, in 2013, the cup holder that used to be a tacky clip-on afterthought is now the most important factor in the purchase <laughs> decision for new cars the and many number consumers. one most important factor. Yeah. That's Gotta not true. We made that holders. part up. But <laughs> <laughs> Josh, uh, on the other hand, who, who would rather, uh, <laughs> rather than waste valuable finger strength opening his Surge Cola like a normal human, <laughs> he prefers actually to eat the entire can and let his overactive digestive system yes. open it for him. My gut <laughs> will crush that can. You know, idea, okay? Extreme cup holder competition, all yep. right? Bring it your own rally car minivan mm -hmm. and the van to make it to the end of the course with the most liquid remaining from the 12 Cherry Big Gulp <laughs> Slush Puppies wins. <laughs> I think that uh, is it. All right, we've got some homework to do. Let's go. Well, Henry Petrosky, thank you so much for joining us today. We like to start off these conversations with a really important and life-altering question. For example, today, Henry, 
If you could give your firstborn child any superhuman power of your choice, but for that privilege, you would have to accept a fatal flaw chosen for you by your worst enemy, would you take that chance? Oh, I'm going to have to diagram that sentence. To figure out. <laughs> <laughs> you can give your firstborn child superhuman powers, but your worst enemy can choose a power for you. Uh, well, uh, tough firstborn one. child is, is uh, 40 years old now, so maybe I could pass on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't you let him fend for himself. <laughs> Too, too hypothetical. Okay, Henry Petrosky, before we get started uh, with the rest of the conversation, uh, we want to get your plug in. I think you have some new books. What, what, what do you got going on? Well, I published a book recently called An Engineer's Alphabet, and it's arranged like a, like a dictionary, A to, a to Z, and I uh, have entries in there that are very short essays about various aspects of, of engineering and design, uh, and uh, I have list top 10 lists i have jokes about engineers it's, it's a real uh, you know, <laughs> i i think it's fun, gold. fun fun to write for me uh, and i have another excellent. book that was published uh, just uh, a few months ago uh, called to forgive design this is actually a companion uh, needs much I forgiveness to engineer a human to forgive the divine uh, right right <laughs> so, you know, love it to forgive design is the title of this new book and I talk about uh, failures uh, of a different kind. Uh, these are system failures, principally. And the illusion of the title is that, you know, when a plane crashes, very often the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, it must have been a design flaw. Mm. Well, uh, very, very often that's not the case. It, it turns out it's, you know, some uh, misuse of the aircraft or uh, some uh, maintenance problem that was not uh, done properly that led to uh, a fatal fatal crash. So this this book is about uh, things like that, and I reflect upon. In the book, I also reflect upon how I got involved with uh, thinking about failure so much. Fantastic. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Uh, get out there and buy those books. Buy two or three copies if you would. I'd appreciate that. Send one of those over to me and Josh. <laughs> there we go. Well, we're uh, really, really excited to hear uh, more about your contributions to the world of design and engineering, in, uh, including many of your books, such as The Evolution of Useful Things. One of my favorite books, by the way. Uh, me too. Love it. Uh, but first, uh, tell us a little more about yourself. Who are you and where, where did you come from? Uh, well, I was born in New York, uh, Brooklyn in particular, uh, grew up uh, in Brooklyn until I was 12 years old. And I, uh, my family moved out to, uh, Queens, another part of New York city where I, uh, uh, learned a lot by delivering newspapers, uh, on a bicycle. And I've written about this in a, in a memoir called paper boy that, uh, uh -huh. really uh, ends up telling how I became an engineer. Basically, uh, I was uh, in high school in 1957 when Sputnik, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first artificial uh, satellite. And uh, anybody who wasn't totally sure of what they wanted to do with their life was advised to go into math, science, or engineering. And I, I went into engineering, mm -hmm. wow. even though I didn't know very much about it at the time. Uh, I was not atypical in that re in that regard, but I've never regretted it. I I uh, got a degree in engineering and uh, then went to graduate school, got two more degrees in engineering, became a professional engineer, uh, began teaching engineering, uh, first at the University of Texas at, at Austin. And uh, then I began to uh, reflect on what is engineering. Mm -hmm. So here I was, I had uh, three degrees in engineering. I was considered a professional engineer, and I was teaching engineering. And if one of my neighbors uh, asked me, what is engineering, I uh, <laughs> didn't have a ready answer. Uh, yeah. so that's when I began to, to uh, get the idea of writing a book, and the title of that book was going to be, What is Engineering? And uh, I, I had learned by then from uh, school, and school assignments, writing assignments, that one of the best ways that I have for, for learning about something is by trying to write about it and explain about it. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, so I started writing this book not knowing really where I was going to end up, what the answer to the question was, but I had some confidence that 
the process of, of writing and being self-critical that if I wasn't convincing myself, I wasn't going to convince any reader. Right, right. I might come to some conclusions that were uh, meaningful, at least to me. Um, so that book ended up being published under the title To Engineer is Human. Uh-huh. Ah. The subtitle is uh, The Role of Failure in Successful Design. Okay, so, so speaking that, of that, let me, let me jump into the next question because I think that's an excellent segue. Now, I mean, you, you are a specialist in failure analysis, which sounds extremely impressive to a layperson like me, but I have to say that sounds a little depressing. Uh, do, <laughs> do you ever get tired of analyzing failures all the time? Why is this an uplifting thing for you? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's my way of learning about, about engineering and uh, turning failures into, into successes. Mm. In the course of writing that book, I concluded that uh, design is at the heart of engineering. Mm. And uh, so then the question is, well, what is design and what is at the heart of design? And uh, my conclusion was that it was failure. Mm. Uh, if you want to design something to be successful, you have to anticipate how it can fail. You have to uh, be able to design safeguards into it, or fuses, mm. sorts of you know tricks and gimmicks, so that it won't fail. Uh, and, and so the root to success is understanding failure. We learn a lot more from failures than we do from successes. When something works, uh, we, we're not always totally sure why it works, or if we think we understand why it works, uh, we may then try to extrapolate and make it better. But because we don't have a full understanding, we, we ultimately find ourselves designing something that has all sorts of flaws and failures built in. Well, into engineer as human, there's a there's a lot of mention of uh, design. Uh, Adam's an industrial designer, and uh, you know, how uh, would you say that uh, something like product design or industrial design fits into that uh, into that thinking? Oh, I, I'd say it fits in. Uh, pretty much uh, the way engineering uh, fits in. Only industrial designers generally have uh, different, different objectives than, than engineers. Engineers are, are often interested only in function or principally in function. As I understand industrial designers, they're interested in not only function but interaction with users, uh, ergonomics, uh, aesthetics in many cases, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so forth. So. Uh, again, it's anticipating. Uh, if yeah. you're trying to, to design is human, also. Right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Now you've actually won one of the oldest and mo most uh, prestigious, you know, awards in engineering, the Washington Award. You won that in 2006, I believe. Wow. Uh, how, what did you have to do to get that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I got a letter in the mail one day. <laughs> it it it's. Uh, I opened it up, and it actually looked to me like uh, junk mail. I almost threw it away. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it was just uh, it was an announcement that I had won this award. And uh, the more I read, the more I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, it was like, I'm pretty you know, cool, very actually. Old and some of the people that <laughs> won it early on and, and, and even continue to win it are very, very distinguished people. So I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be you mm. know, considered in that, that, that company. Well, it's warranted, uh, yeah. Yeah, you had uh, written several books for that. I imagine uh, uh, that was one reason uh, why you won the award. And one of those books was actually adapted into the BBC, uh, BBC television documentary, the one you mentioned, To Engineer as Human. Now, in having that made into a television uh, documentary, were you part of that? And uh, do you think that they really captured the idea of the book? <laughs> well, I pretty much wrote wrote the script. Oh, really? Oh, uh, yeah? I guess I have to think that I, I captured Okay, yeah, I guess so, if you're, if you're uh, that yeah, involved yeah. with it. If you wrote the script. I, yeah. I was directly involved in it. Uh, oh, great. It, it was, again, by uh, accident, I guess, uh, the book had been published, and a, a British edition of the book came out uh -huh. uh, about a year after the book was published, and uh, a BBC television producer called me up one day and said, this is, this is very interesting. We're, we'd like to consider it for a, a BBC documentary, uh, uh, sort of like what Nova is in this country. I don't know uh -huh. if you know, it was uh -huh. called Horizon over there in Britain. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. I said, are you ever going to be in London in the next you know, year or so that we could talk about this? I said, well, actually, I'm coming to London next week. And I was. Oh, wow. I over there to teach for six weeks. So we began a dialogue and talking. And uh, I, I was asked to write what they call a treatment in television, uh, which is a sort of a script, but it's, it's, it's more of an outline than verbatim. Mm. And uh, they also wanted me to be what they call the presenter. So I was on camera. Oh, uh, wow. Explaining the book and the, the ideas behind it. And it was a very interesting experience. It was a very, very time consuming experience. And I, 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 I enjoyed uh, the opportunity to see how a show is, is produced like, like that. And to me, it was another example of design and you know how you go from an idea to a product. So uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, you always hear people, you always hear authors talking about what a drag it is to have their, their work like translated for screen. It sounds like you found it to be a really fun and interesting, invigorating kind of experiment. That, that sounds fun. Well, I did. I, I believe that, you know, as I say, it's a, it's a design problem mm-hmm. to come up with a production. And uh, I believe that engineering is, you know, uh, involves a lot of compromise. And there are always constraints that you have to work within. So uh, although, you know, it, it, I had to give in here and there about how we would do this or what we would emphasize, but there was always a, a, a reason behind right. uh, behind. Right, and, right. Uh, you know... I, I, I was satisfied. I'm, I'm still satisfied. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, so in addition to, you know, the product design kinds of applications, you also specialize in structural and civil engineering applications. From your experience, what can industrial designers and mechanical engineers learn from civil engineering failures? And then also, you know, vice versa. What, uh, what could civil engineers maybe learn from, uh, from product design and engineering? Well, one of the interesting things about civil engineering and structural engineering in particular is that it's got a long history. We've been building, you know, buildings, towers, pyramids for, you know, millennia. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of experience, and most of the really valuable experience is in the failures that have occurred over the centuries. And in civil engineering, in particular in bridge engineering, uh, you can, after you start studying these, bridge failures, you begin to see patterns. You begin to see there's there are repeating patterns of, of, of what happens. First, there's a design, and uh, generally, if that design works well, engineers, designers want to improve upon it. If it's a bridge, they want to make it lighter and longer, uh, more sleek looking, and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah. this, has, this has been happening over especially the most recent centuries, the last couple of hundred years, with, with railroad bridges. And uh, the, invariably, there is, a, there is a failure when things are pushed too, too far. Mm-hmm. It shows us that, that, that engineers, designers generally uh, begin to become overconfident and they begin to start reaching a little too far. And they often forget some of the fundamental assumptions that went into what they're doing, uh, such as designing a, a bridge. Uh, one big problem with, with bridges, for example, uh, historically has been the wind. If, if the wind uh, blows in, in a certain way with a certain strength and the bridge is not compatible with that wind, <laughs> the bridge gets blown down. Uh, but engineers, even, even in the 20th century, have seemed to have forgotten uh, these fundamental ideas. There's a there's a misconception that because, you know, say we have computers, say we have you know better ways of calculating uh, the forces involved and the stresses involved, that we can therefore it simply follows that we you can don't build have to a, think anymore. You, yeah. Right, that's that's the key. It, what what's what's really important is thinking, not right. calculating. Right. Right. Someone already built this bridge, so that this one's going to work. <laughs> So I thought to generalize to design, you know, beyond civil engineering, I think that whole idea of thinking, it's, it's, it's thinking Not once you get into a problem, or at least this is my, my experience, you start solving a problem, uh, you, you uh, get further and further from your initial thinking, from your initial concept, your initial uh, assumptions, recognition of, of uh, limitations. Mm-hmm. And as you get further and further from that, you begin to get just wrapped up in the calculations or in the, the uh, 
to the evolution of the design. And that can be very dangerous. Mm. Mm. Uh, we have bridges and then we have, uh, you know, everyday objects that we use like pins, paper clips, pencils. Um, a few of your books really get into the history of these objects and how they came to be. Uh, you know, some of it's just amazing, like all that goes into a pencil, uh, for instance. Uh, you bring up a, a great point in, in one of them, Invention by Design, I believe, that there are no simple inventions and no such thing as routine design. Can you el uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, in that book, I, I, I begin by talking a lot about the paperclip. I have a whole chapter on paperclips. Yeah. And it seems like such a simple concept. Uh, in fact, very often newspapers or magazines will run a feature story and they'll ask a lot of designers, architects, what's the greatest design of all time or the top 10? And very, very often the paperclip ends up on that, that list. Mm. Uh -huh. But what I find uh, fascinating is that the architects will, will describe the paperclip just geometrically. They'll describe how graceful its curves are and how it loops, has a loop around a loop and so forth and so on. They see it as a, as a static object that is really disembodied from its function, whereas engineers see a simple product like that even a simple product like that, uh, in terms of its function, what is it supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to clip papers together. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and when you put a paper clip on a stack of papers, it becomes pretty ugly. It gets all bent out of shape. It doesn't look oh, yeah. anywhere near. It doesn't last too long. Architects <laughs> are describing. So form versus function gets you know <laughs> uh, uh, involved involved there. I, I find uh, even something so simple as a paper clip. Um, I've looked uh, at patents for paper clips over the past uh, century plus, and it's wow. amazing how many there are. And it's amazing some of the uh, most interesting inventors I've ever met, people that are inventing things like um, uh, medical devices, for example, uh, they take it as a personal challenge to uh, invent and patent uh, an, an improved paper clip, one that's going to be you know, better than all the others. None of them, to my knowledge, has yet succeeded mm. because, again, they lose sight of what they're trying to do. You've got to keep it simple. And invariably, these paper clips they come up with are too complicated, which means they're complicated to manufacture, which means they're expensive to manufacture, which means they're going to be expensive to buy. And who wants to pay, you know, 10 or 20 times what you need to pay for something that is supposed to have a simple, simple function? Now, you mentioned, uh -huh. you know, people making lists about the top 10 designs of all time, and I guess you could rephrase that. What are the top 10 success stories of all time in design and engineering? And uh, for you, it sounds like a more interesting question to ask would be, what, what in your opinion, are the top few uh, most important failures in the history of design and engineering from your standpoint? Well, that's a fair, fair question. Uh, uh, on the, near the top of that list would certainly be the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which this was uh -huh. a, a bridge that was a uh, opened in 1940 uh, over Puget Sound out in Washington State. It was a suspension bridge. At the time, it was the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Uh, the only longer ones were the Golden Gate Bridge, which opened in 1937, mm -hmm. and the uh, George Washington Bridge, which opened in 1931. Uh, so the Tacoma Narrows Bridge was the third longest. It's 2,700 feet between the towers. But uh, there was something happening in the late 1930s in the design of bridges, and uh, that was that engineers of all kinds were trying to make them look as sleek as possible. They were trying to make them look as slender as possible, and they, they just went overboard with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, and it was open for four months, and it uh, collapsed in the wind in, uh, after just four months of, of standing. Wow. Mm -hmm. As these people hadn't thought, the engineers hadn't thought, they got tied up in their uh, 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 attempts to make it uh, light and slender. So anyway, it's Coman Arrows Bridge is certainly one because uh, it, it really shows how, it, it shows us so many things. It shows, what for one, it shows you that if you think about fundamental uh, assumptions, uh, you're less likely to end up having a failure like that. But anyway, the Tacoma Arrows Bridge would be on that list. Another that would be on that list for me 
uh, would be the Hyatt Regency Hotel in Kansas City in 1981. Ah. About 114 people were killed when some elevated walkways collapsed all of a sudden. Yeah. Mm. And uh, this was the largest uh, death by structural collapse uh, till that time. And uh, it, it was really devastating. Uh, and it was just such a simple mistake. Uh, the mistake that was made involved just a simple change of how these walkways were supported. None of the engineers uh, caught the mistake, uh, and yet it's the kind of problem we'll give our sophomore engineering students today uh, to, you know, why would this not work? Mm -hmm. uh, so so it's, it doesn't have to be something complicated to cause a failure. Uh, it's, it's something that, that is overlooked. Uh, well, uh, to lighten up a little more, I want to get back to the, the, the little simple things, everyday objects, because you just, you really mm. uh, pick through them in a, a lot of your books um, in uh, the, uh, the evolution of things. You really get into the history of the fork. Yeah. And another great, one, great the story. toothpick. Yeah. Uh, you explore the history of uh, the, the, the toothpick as a tool. Um, what, what, what inspires you and draws you to dig deeper into the history of these, of these objects? Well, what first drove me was, you know, this first book to engineers human, which was about engineering and design generally, but mostly illustrated with examples from bridges mm -hmm. and buildings. Uh, I wondered, I, I, I sort of had confidence that the same arguments would work for simple things. And, mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you know, that whole book is a hypothesis. You've got, I've got this hypothesis that uh, uh, failure is, uh, thinking about failure is the way you achieve success. So I thought, well, that should work for the simplest of objects too. And, it, and the argument should be even more transparent because you don't have all this complex technology messing it up. And that's why I started looking into the evolution of things like the paper clip and the pencil and, mm. and, and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, ah. The toothpick in particular, uh, that was sort of an accident. Uh, I, I spend summers in Maine. That's where I do most of my writing of these, these books. Mm -hmm. And one summer, it was, there were a lot of stories in the newspaper. That all the toothpick factories in Maine were, were closing because they were being, toothpicks were being manufactured overseas. Okay. So it, and, and prior to this, about 95% of the toothpicks in the world at one time were made in Maine. Wow. So this was a <laughs> perfect example, I thought, of the manufacturing going over, you know, offshore and American manufacturing, you know, sort of going down the tubes. Uh -huh. And I, I thought of it as a big case study, but I always like to give background to what I'm writing about. So I had to first talk about the history of the toothpick and, you know, how it, how it evolved. Well, tell me about and, how you do that. What, when you have an idea, a germ of an idea like that, and you're like, I need to write about the history of the toothpick, where do you, where do you start? Do you go down to the public library and start checking out books? What, what's, your, what's your process for that? Uh, pretty much. Start, start reading. Yeah. Um, and, and you're not going to find a history of the toothpick you know, in the library right, books. Right, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's why I ask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to write books that haven't you know, been written before. So, but... There will be a history of the toothpick in a little article somewhere, or, you know, and, uh, and you, especially if you can find articles that are, uh, let's say, more academic, they will have references and, and bibliographies. Right, so that right. leads you to other articles and uh, uh, sort of know that you've reached the, the, the end of your research when you can't find anything new. Mm. You know, you've say, oh, I've read that, I've read that, everything you see coming across your, your desk. And then if you have a have an idea of, you know, how these, these things do evolve, if you have a general theory, then it's, it's a matter of uh, making sure for this new particular, particular object. And uh, I, I, in the case of the toothpick in particular, so much of that really had to do with the manufacture of toothpicks which means the machinery to manufacture toothpicks, because that's what made the toothpick, uh, uh, the wooden toothpick at least, as we know it, uh, such a success. It made a guy up in Maine called Charles Forster a millionaire, mm. literally. I mean, and, and, and so it, I had to go into a lot of patent 
work. And oh, when you read right. patents, you begin to learn a lot too. Uh, some patents are, are very dry to read, but others, they give away secrets uh, about, you know, the history and, and, the and also evolution. the thought processes, I would think they kind of show process, what they think are exactly. important. Yeah. Yes. And, and so given your, your background in failure analysis and kind of explore, exploring the history of everyday objects and, and how they're manufactured, um, you know, we we blog a lot these days about, you know, up and coming things. Everybody loves to talk about 3D printing right now. It's the it's it's the new sexy thing. And, um, you know, we've we've talked with a lot of folks about that. What are your thoughts on kind of the more uh, personalized manufacturing techniques that are being made possible by this kind of revolution of of electronic making machines at home? Well, I, I would think it's going to follow similar patterns of, of evolution and change and uh there will be successes and there will be be, be failures <laughs> of course yeah it, you know it's, it's a competitive uh field and whenever there's competition that means that some people are going to try to to make a product that's uh less expensive so they can capture more of the of their share of the share of the market but of course when you try to make something less expensive you what are you what are you sacrificing everything's mm-hmm. a trade-off in design and and engineering and uh, uh, so uh, the best will, 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 will survive in, in the end. But what the best is, is, is also very difficult to, uh, to define sometimes or to identify because uh, this involves judgment. What do people judge to be the, the, best, the best? And everybody, even, even people in technology fields are subject to suggestion and so forth and you know, publicity and promotion by by companies, large and, and small. So, so I don't expect, ultimately, the field is going to uh, evolve much differently. The products will be different, of course, because it's a different product field. But, but I think the, 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 the way the uh, people involved will behave and will interact is, is going to be the same human nature that we've seen. Why does everybody want to read Steve Jobs' you know, biography? Because you know, they want to try to figure out how he did it. Well, that's, that's very difficult to, to, to do. Uh, business biographies are very popular, but mm-hmm. they usually are success stories. Right, right. <laughs> and yeah. I read those books. I, I, I read them too. I find them fascinating. Yeah. But what I'm always looking for are the failure stories that right, are embedded right. in them. And they're usually there, but they're they're, they're not highlighted as much. See, that's what Josh and I need to do. We need to write a book just showing what epic failures we are. And that that would there, be way more valuable than the well, Steve Jobs book. It'll biography. be easier for you to write that book. <laughs> but Henry, uh, you know, uh, we've talked a lot about the failures. There's been quite a few successes uh, stemming from those. And you mentioned earlier people making lists of these best designs of all time. I kind of get the impression you don't think it's the paperclip. I don't know. So what uh, do you think is the most important design of all time? I, I probably would, would uh, go more with the pencil. Uh, wow. The, uh, okay. The lead pencil is very important, and it's precursors, of course, uh, because this is intimately tied up with literacy, and, and literacy is uh, you know what makes ah. a society function and, and you know, aspire to, to bigger and better, better things. There, there have been times when uh, countries that were in you know, bad straits financially and economically uh, would ask for pencils of, of all kinds that you know, mm. we would throw out, you know, or the stub of a pencil, maybe an inch or two. You know, uh-huh. These were collected to send to, to, to come to countries that, uh, that, that needed them. The, wow. the modern uh, process for the, the pencil was actually uh, invented in France in the late uh, uh, late 18th century when France was at war with, with England. And since England was the supplier to the world of graphite at the time, good graphite at least, uh, France had to figure out how they were going to get uh, pencils out of bad graphite. So uh, a fellow named Nicolas Jacques Conte uh, came up with a, a process and it was really war-related research. It was military uh, research because huh. uh, France's military machine couldn't operate without without pencils. 
you know, huh. this reminds me of a, this reminds to, me of a funny anecdote. Uh, I remember a friend telling me a while back, you know, we, uh, in the 1950s realized that our ballpoint pens wouldn't work in space because it's not a pressurized environment. So they, you know, spend millions of dollars developing the space pen and then the Russians just use a pencil. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Upside down. <laughs> right. <laughs> and well, it doesn't need batteries. And also, you know, yeah. that, there have been a lot of jokes too about the pencil, the wood case pencil as being the, uh, let's see, the first word processor. And, uh, you know, it's more reliable because it doesn't run out of uh, batteries. <laughs> right, right. A lot cheaper, too. got a too. delete button, which is called an eraser, and, you know, the whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, Henry, I am very sad to say it, but, uh, we're, you know, you've got other things to do, I'm sure, so we're going to have to wrap it up. But one last question for you. You know, we love to ask people, especially somebody as seasoned as you, what kind of advice do you have for uh, engineers and designers professionally, but also for younger people who are interested in engineering and design? What, what, what one piece of advice would you give to those people? I would say, you know, try to learn about the history of what you're working in. The, uh, the, the, the lessons that, that people that worked in the field early on uh, uh, can, can, you know, can tell you, uh, because there, there's a lot uh, in any field that is implicit and tacit knowledge that, that isn't really taught in school so, so readily. Uh, what did people think when they were first coming up with, say, 3D printers? What were the fundamental problems? Those are probably still the fundamental problems, but they're often forgotten mm. in you know, the, the uh, hoopla about the latest and, and the greatest. But uh, ultimately, you have to go back to the roots of, of a field, of a product, category and understand how the product came out of uh, virtually nothing and uh, you know to where it is and if you want to take it further if you want to improve upon it you want to take it to a higher level knowing uh, where it came from is is really uh, really essential well henry uh, wow. petrosky thank you so much uh, for your time today Indeed. it's been uh, great having you on the show well yes. thank you i enjoyed it Josh, uh, having Henry Petrosky on this show by listener request was even more fun than riding on the roof of your rally van with a beer hat full of juice boxes. <laughs> ah, yes. 98% sugar and 2% juice. Yep. If you'd like to send us delicious <laughs> sugar spike liquids, please address those to Josh. And if you'd like to send used copies of your favorite Steely Dan records melted down and bottled for drinking, please address those to Adam. <laughs> Let us know what you think, uh, who you want to see on the show, and your favorite nostalgic beverage flavor at engineerversusdesigner.com or on the EVD YouTube and or Vimeo channels. And if you'd like to see us drink gallons of that Kool-Aid, be sure to like us, plus one us, tweet us, or whatever else us as social media has been correlated with unrealistic expectations and inflated overstatements of minor successes. <laughs> the show has been edited <laughs> by the masterful Simon Martin. If you love our taste in music... And you want to get more of that, be sure to check out our new playlist every Tuesday over at SolidSmack.com. You know, we'll see you next week. And remember, without engineers, designers would starve to death while drawing pretty pictures of impossible foods. And without designers, yeah. engineers would manufacture massive quantities of nutritious but inedible food cubes. <laughs> <laughs> food cubes. <laughs> Crunchy yet satisfying. I wonder if there's a human alive who could, like, swallow... <laughs> A, a, an entire meat cube hole. <laughs> I want to see that. I want to see you see that tried. <laughs> There's a good market for meat cubes nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You just buy them like ice cubes and you put them in your drink. <laughs> in your drinkable meat slurpee. <laughs> that guy just ate like 50 meat cubes. Did you see that? <laughs> that is disgusting, man. I'm, I'm a vegan. From now on, you just, you just made me a vegan. Does he keep them inside his, like, behind his coat? In his, in his in like oddly square stomach cavity. <laughs> <laughs> Next laps. A production of EBD Media.